Hi everyone, welcome to the webinar Storytelling with Maps for Nonprofits. My name is Jen Van Dusen and I will be your host for today. I'm with Esri, the global leader in GIS or Geographic Information Systems, where I support nonprofits and mission-driven organizations and telling their stories of positive social and environmental impact. I'm joined today by my three guests, Andrew Schroeder, Vice President of Research and Analysis at Direct Relief, Maria Alicia Serrano, Senior Director of Research, Analytics and Insights at the YMCA of the USA, and Alison Davis Holland, Cartography and Story Maps Lead at Self Represented Litigation Network. Welcome to our panel and welcome to our listeners. Today we're going to talk about storytelling with maps maps that bring together different types of social, environmental, and economic data, and then embedding those maps into a story map that provides an interactive and multimedia experience to bring the data behind the story to life in a way that is both informative and emotional, so both left brain and right brain. Allison, Maria, Alicia, and Andrew will each share their stories. This will then be followed by a roundtable discussion. With that, let's get started and I'll hand over to you, Allison. Take it away. Hi, Jen. Thanks for inviting me to share our story. I lead the Cartography and Story Map initiatives at the Self-Represented Litigation Network. We're a small nonprofit with a handful of staff across the country. Our mission is to support justice advocates who help families and communities thrive by working to ensure that every person can address their essential civil legal needs. Essential civil legal needs are basic things like housing, safety, food security, health, education, wages, obtaining benefits after natural disasters, and family matters. We work together to advance innovative practices and reforms that enable people to solve their essential civil legal needs on their own without lawyers. In our sector of access to justice, it is incredibly important to share stories and improve awareness. We use story maps like these to create stories that demonstrate the impact of their work, ground truth assumptions, and inspire change. Using story maps, we weave together photos, visuals, graphics, audio, interactive maps, and narratives to tell compelling stories that engage and move people to get involved. Today, I'll be sharing our story map called Ferguson is Happening in New York from our members, the Fines and Fees Justice Center and the No Price on Justice Coalition. In 2014, a police officer killed Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. A Department of Justice investigation found that the Ferguson Police Department was engaged in aggressive, racially discriminatory policing practices, all in order to increase the city's revenue by imposing fines and fees. Years later, New York is continuing this practice of relying on predatory fines and court fees to fund government. The coalition wanted to tell the story in a compelling way, so they turned to us to create a story map. The story map allows the reader to see how little reliance on fines and fees had actually changed over the years. The coalition was then able to improve transparency and provide policy recommendations to better address the issue. So what are fines and fees? We introduce a statement of the problem and then we define for the reader what the fines and fees are so they can be more involved in the process. Fines are the financial penalties used to punish people. They are often imposed for minor violations like traffic tickets or failing to use a turn signal. For those who can't afford to pay, they risk being charged with more money in fines and fees, losing their driver's license, being arrested, and even jailed. The fees, which we show here with a visual, can range up to $300 for standard off the bat fees, and they're a really hard thing for people to be able to afford if they're already in a tight situation. So we move on after kind of describing the terms and issues about how this actually impacts people's lives. So we profiled a couple people and we gave some context in terms of the affordability of these fines and fees. Uh, we told people's hardships and we described that 40% of US households did not have $500 to spare without borrowing money or selling possessions. So a $300 um, uh, fee would you know, be a disproportionate uh, burden for people uh, that are already in a tight financial situation. 
So let's go ahead and dive into some of the interactive maps that we use to de describe the extent of the problem. In our case, we wanted to look at how um, how much uh, reliance on fines and fees the, by percentage of the total revenue that was generated from these fines and fees. And the light blue areas, these are areas that have low reliance, and then it goes up through orange and red with areas that have higher reliance. In our case, we knew our story was that we didn't have a big change between 2014 and 2018. So we didn't just want to have a static map that would just show those two things and not have much to glean from it. We wanted people to be able to interact with the data and look at their local level of geography into their locality. So in 2014, it looked like this. In 2018, it looked like this. Very minor changes between the two. So we wanted to be able to let people click on this specific locality, understand the percentage of the revenue generated from fines and fees in one year, and then be able to compare that to 2018. And our story was there's very little change between the years. Um, so we really liked this interactivity that enabled people to drill down. Um, often the slider maps are used to show kind of cause and effect variables like a community's rate of obesity and the community's rate of diabetes. Um, but in this case, we wanted to show the longitudinal change of time and say there hasn't been changes, even though four years have gone by. So that was really a powerful tool for um, advocates to be able to use. Then the next is we wanted to say which local governments have increased their reliance over these years on fines and fees. So we examined the data and we looked and we determined that 504 local governments, the red areas, had increased their reliance on fines and fees, and 243 local governments, the lighter areas, still were not even reporting legally mandated data on fines and fees. So it was showing that either the problem was bad or the problem was not um, being open and transparent with the government. So, I mean, with uh, the audience. So we kind of established the need in a different way. So story maps can be really powerful in bringing together different ways of thinking about your data, as well as these different media. So lastly, um, we pulled together some charts that had to do with how the surcharges um, compared to inflation. And in all cases for violations, misdemeanor and felony, the surcharges were greater than expected for inflation. So just another way to pull in the media that we that we have, we've got, you know, personal narratives, the logic of the story, the geographic context for the story, and, and now another way to look at data um, economically and through charts. So bottom line, of the story is that we wanted to let everybody know that it's time to end predatory court fines and fees. We wanted to tell them that they could go to the website for our policy recommendations. They can get involved in the coalition and they can stay informed. So that's a common thing that we do towards the end of story maps where we present the situation, we appeal in different ways, and then we show an actionable um, item, all in the kind of linear format that makes the reader want to get through the entire story and understand the nature of the problem and uh, potential solutions. So it was a really effective um, mechanism for us to do that. So where are we now? On New Year's Eve, Governor Cuomo signed the Driver's License Suspension Reform Act, which started the conversations about fines and fees reform in New York State. This act ended the practice of suspending a person's driver's license when they can't afford to pay a traffic fine. As for predatory fines and fees, the coalition has its bill introduced into the assembly. This end predatory court fees act would eliminate court fees, mandatory minimum fines, garnishment of commissionary accounts, and incarceration on the basis of unpaid fines and fees. So we're really pleased with the progress that the story maps have uh, afforded us. And we're excited to be able to help the coalition tell their story with mapping and story maps and this engaged with this uh, interactive media. And we're looking forward to the progress in the coming months. Awesome. Thank you so much, Allison. And we'll move to Maria Alicia. Thank you, Jen. I'm excited to be here to tell you a bit more about the work that the YMCA is doing to expand 
and our use of data to achieve our purpose of strengthening communities. The Y was founded over 176 years ago with a focus on meeting pressing social needs and what was extremely unique at the time, ensuring that we we're supporting the needs of all segments of society. On the screen, you see a few stats about the YMCA in the United States. We have a large national footprint and you most likely have seen a building or a school with our logo on the side. But the Y isn't just a building, it's a it's the people from all backgrounds and walks of life who come together to improve their lives, nurture families, and strengthen communities. Now to achieve our purpose of strengthening communities, we work across three areas of focus. In youth development, we seek to nurture the potential of all children and young adults, providing them with the tools and resources they need to succeed in life whether it be our after school programs for youth or our achievers programs which promote success after high school. Our focus on healthy living is about improving the nation's health and well-being by reducing risk for disease through programs such as our diabetes prevention program. And finally, our focus on social responsibility is about ensuring that we are responding to society's most pressing social issues whether it be racial inequity, access to affordable quality childcare, and we do this all through innovative community-based solutions. As Jen mentioned, I'm with YMCA of the USA, which is the National Resource Office for YMCAs. And one of our functions at YMCA of the USA is to deliver the resources that the Ys need so that they can do data, um, they can make data-driven decisions. Now, like many nonprofits, it's been a desire we've had for years to really expand our use of data. And we've been fortunate that we've been able to make significant investments in the technological infrastructure required to not just collect, but also analyze the data. But as pretty as this, uh, all the blocks are on the screen, you can't just jump from data to analytics to decisions. People need support to pull out the insights from their decisions. So in 2020, we launched the Insights Hub for staff at the national office, as well as for WISE who are providing consulting services to other WISE. The Insights Hub provides a centralized place for accessing data and insights, in particular our community insights tool, which provides WISE with a wealth of information about their community. We had really strong reaction when we launched the community insights tool. However, the feedback that we also received was that WISE who were doing consulting needed support and helping communicate their story. So instead of starting with a map with lots of great layers of data, we created a story map. And so why can think about all of the questions they need to answer and have some additional guidance in answering them? For example, a why may be considering starting a program that's focused in on helping the most socially vulnerable. And what's key is that they understand where those individuals are relative to their location. So you see here the West Cook YMCA located in suburban Chicago. And by selecting the social vulnerability index, the Y is able to see populations that have a high that are high in social vulnerability as they consider the types of support and resources and services they need to offer. As the why continues thinking about how we can best respond to addressing racial inequity, an important factor as well as understanding the racial and ethnic characteristics of individuals who live near and around our facilities. So as this case, the why can select what is most common race ethnicity to help guide them in thinking about what some of the decisions that they might make are. In addition to allowing whys to understand how to tell the story of their community, they can use the story map to also consider how do we tell the story of the need within our community for particular programs. A co program that many eyes many wise offer is a high blood pressure prevention. And while there may be a temptation from a Y to offer the program because they've heard about other wise offering it, what's key is what does the local community need? So the Y can use this story map and select high blood pressure prevention 
and get a sense of around their community where their need is. So instead of just choosing to locate a high blood pressure prevention program at the West Cook Wise main facility, this map allows them to understand that their best approach would be to locate the program offsite closer to these areas that are in the darker pink, indicating a higher need for blood pressure prevention. Similarly, with the diabetes prevention program, a Y can select this button here and they're able to see where there's need for support with either diabetes management or prevention. And it's similar to the high blood pressure prevention, which we often see there's a strong need in this portion of the community. I mentioned that the Y may consider offering services instead of at its main facility offsite. And that's one of the things the Y is really great at, which is collaborating with nonprofits and our other nonprofits in our community. Instead of focusing in on the services that could just be offered at a Y site, the Y is able to use this story map to identify other potential partners. So for example, one of our uh, larger partners are local school districts where we can provide after school programs, as well as public housing authorities where there are individuals who might need support from the Y in either affordable or free childcare, as well as support in, um, in welcoming um, individuals to their community who may be new and may want to know, know more about the resources. So Y is able to select other public housing resources and see where there are public housing communities near their location. The story map has gotten a really strong response back from our Ys. They've indicated that being having additional guidance and looking at and understanding their community instead of starting with just a map is really valuable and helps them understand and better communicate not only the programs and services that we're able to offer, but the ones that we should offer based upon the community's needs and characteristics. Thank you. Thank you, Maria Alicia, and over to Andrew. All right. Um, well, my name is Andrew Schroeder. Um, I'm going to talk about the, uh, similar issues to the what you've been hearing so far uh, from a, a somewhat more uh, global standpoint um, from uh, the point of view of direct relief's work um, with Rohingya refugees uh, in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, direct relief, just to, for a little context, is a um, international uh, and U.S. Uh, humanitarian aid agency. We work in the medical sector, principally in the distribution of essential medicines and medical supplies for uh, on a charitable basis to support local healthcare programs um, in 90 countries, all 50 U.S. states. Um, and uh, one of our kind of key areas of concern over the last few years has been in Myanmar and Bangladesh, uh, southern Bangladesh, uh, with the response to um, the refugee crisis, which was response, uh, which was uh, prompted by uh, uh, violence which occurred in, in Myanmar. Um, so this is thinking then about um, how do we use story maps to help advance understanding of humanitarian aid uh, around the world. Um, just to, for a little bit of context, this is a story that um, has been maybe in the news in recent days even uh, with the events uh, with the coup uh, that took place in Myanmar. Uh, but uh, down here in uh, southern Bangladesh in the district of Cox's Bazaar, uh, there were uh, a large number of refugees that came across the border uh, who were uh, subject to uh, genocidal violence in their own country um, and were admitted into Bangladesh to uh, for purposes of refuge and sanctuary um, and uh, who then uh, formed the uh, one of the largest refugee communities in the world. Um, just really quick to give you some orientation to the situation. Um, this started back in uh, August of 2017. Uh, so this is this has been happening for a few years. Uh, there are uh, over 800,000 uh, Rohingya, which is a Muslim minority uh, living now in uh, Cox's Bazaar in a set of camps that were set up by the Bangladeshi government and served by a range of international organizations. Um, Direct Relief's role, particularly in this area, is to help support local healthcare programs uh, that we've supported long before this crisis uh, to 
uh, provide medical services uh, to uh, the communities that are living in this area. Um, we principally work uh, with an organization called Hope Hospital, which is um, the largest uh, uh, hospital in the area that provides uh, maternal and newborn care. Um, they have transformed themselves through the course of this uh, crisis into uh, one of the largest providers of, of medical services per se, not, not only to um, women and newborns, um, and uh, have really been leading a lot of the medical response in this area uh, from a local uh, point of view. They're a Bangladeshi organization. Um, and, you know, we immediately started thinking through ways to uh, begin explaining what was going on um, in uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar uh, in order to be able to uh, make it clear to the folks that we're engaged with from the donor community to um, our kind of uh, general public engagement, uh, social media communities and others, uh, what is at stake in this particular crisis um, and, and how should we understand uh, what it means to respond to it. Um, and story maps, I think, are, are one of the best ways to do this, actually. We, um, you know, need to understand that these are complex emergencies. So um, they they occur in multiple dimensions. They're, they're simultaneously crises that are political, they are uh, medical, they involve um, movements of large numbers of people, they involve intercultural dynamics, um, uh, multiple governments, um, uh, disasters, natural disasters hit this population as well. How do we uh, kind of get all of that into one uh, story or one kind of document or approach? Not not easy to do. Um, we can map them out. Uh, we can use maps and we do use maps of, of a pretty wide variety all the time. Uh, to kind of capture some of these dynamics. Um, and this is, I think, essential to the work we do, but it doesn't work that well um, in terms of broad spectrum audience um, approaches uh, without incorporating other media into it. We, we, we lose, I think, important aspects of, of some of that activity. Um, so we want to remain, in other words, data driven. We want to be uh, focused on the evidence, but we want to be narratively focused as well. We want to be able to con convey the texture of human experience that really makes it uh, possible for many of us around the world to empathize with what's happening uh, in what may be, uh, what may feel to us like something that is very remote and far away from our day-to-day -day existence. Um, it's also worth noting that these are large scale events. I mean, I mentioned that the number of refugees that have crossed over and are living in the camps in Bangladesh is, is uh, eight, uh, over 800,000, uh, between 800,000 and 900,000, depending on, um, you know, the time that you're recording it. Um, so very large scale events, but, but um, you know, these are always events that matter to individual people um, and they're composed of, of thousands upon thousands of stories. So how do we make it so that we can understand uh, all of the various scales at which these kinds of events play out? Um, and in that context, we want to understand uh, scientifically uh, how things are related together, but humanize those stories. And I think this concept of humanizing uh, is something I'll come back to later on as we think about why the medium of the story map actually makes so much sense here. So the the particular story map that that I'm going to talk about, um, and we we made several actually around around this particular crisis, um, is one that that focuses in on uh, work that was done by refugees uh, by uh, Rohingya communities in the camps to improve their communities, to uh, recognize the risks that they faced as they are in a very um, environmentally exposed area. Uh, they're subject to a variety of different hazards um, and they want to um, improve the conditions that they're working in, so that they're living in so that they can um, be more resilient to, to a, a range of threats. Um, I, I would like to note too, just in case you're worried about like how much work it is to build a story map, this particular map was built by an intern at Direct Relief over the course of a few weeks uh, during a summer working with us. Um, and so, you know, this is uh, important to remember that uh, the barrier to entry is pretty low here, um, uh, an astonishing intern, but nevertheless, uh, someone who who really learned a lot of this on, on the fly. Um, so, you know, 
one way to think about um, kind of this multi-dimensional uh, aspect of the crisis and the work that's being done by refugees is to think about uh, the deforestation um, impact that's happened um, in their community. So um, as communities, uh, as a, as the people moved into these areas, as, as you had these large communities built, um, there was a large amount of land clearance that occurred um, and that opened up the land to landslides and other hazards. So um, they began to search for ways to find alternate energy sources to cutting down trees and uh, burning uh, burning the carbon in those trees for fuel. Uh, one of those was around uh, areas that focused on developing compressed rice husks as a source of fuel. What does that mean? Um, so these are areas where um, uh, you can see the communities in the background uh, that uh, are part of that map that I just showed you uh, and where rice was then planted in a lot of these areas. The rice itself actually serves as ways to root some of these areas, the, the, the land in the area, um, and it also produces um, the ability to, to compress the husks of the rice um, that can then be burned and turned into fuel um, and, and is a much more um, easily replenished source of uh, energy for communities that are living in these areas. Um, similarly, we saw um, infrastructure uh, that was damaged repeatedly by storms. Um, these are very dense communities. We're, we're looking here at uh, a set of camps that are that are packed into only a, a few square kilometer area. Um, they were hit by significant storms in 2018 that, that came through the Bay of Bengal and, and came up into Cox's Bazaar uh, that wiped away uh, land that uh, had formed the, the basis of these roads and made it almost impossible to get around certain parts of this camp. That, that one main road is one of the only arteries that allows you to get from north to south in this entire camp. Um, and, you know, what does this look like? What does it feel like in order to uh, experience road closures and, and outages in these areas? Um, you know, we're talking about um, places where, uh, you know, sandbag reinforcement has to be done, where bamboo is is used as a, um, a lattice work to, that keeps the uh, land in place in these areas and where uh, bridges were uh, constructed bridges that often were subject themselves to disaster, but where communities had to um, self um, develop their own infrastructure projects in order to be able to make these areas navigable over time. Um, relocation became quite, uh, an important uh, area uh, of, of, of focus for the communities. These are uh, the green areas show expansion from those uh, camp areas that I was showing you in the earlier infrastructure map. Um, and uh, where uh, communities uh, were um, banding together to determine how to be able to move uh, uh, households and families from one place to another um, in a safe fashion. Uh, so uh, to be able to make sure that they could expand without losing their belongings, without losing their, their connections um, and without uh, losing their access to services. Um, and so you see um, the construction of housing by um, communities themselves um, that were able to relocate families inside the camps as you as you had continuous uh, new development um, that occurred in order to make life tolerable for people that were uh, living within these kinds of circumstances. Each one of these stories um, is something which shows, I think, the self-organizing activity of refugees in these circumstances so that they are really the active authors of their lives and are not just simply subject to external events. Um, and I think that is something that we will come back to um, as we talk about later, um, how we can uh, better understand crisis in using story maps. Thanks very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Andrea. So now we'll head into our roundtable discussion. And let's get started with Maria, Alicia and the YMCA. Uh, Maria, Alicia, there's a lot of data that goes into understanding the communities that the Y serves. Um, I think the word uh, complex came up in, in, I think, everyone's presentation today. Why did the Y specifically decide to use that geographic lens to understand their communities? 
So uh, the geographic lens is important because, as I showed on the initial map, the Y is has locations across the country. And one of the things that makes our work so interesting is that each Y is able to serve the needs of that particular community. And so understanding that what people experience and their needs are are influenced by place, right? The um, really groundbreaking work that Raj Chetty did that about how your zip code determines your outcome. And so we've actually used some of that data to, as we think about working with youth, what is the result long term for youth if they grow up in a particular zip code? That's about place. What's the result long term for youth if they're in a school in a particular zip code? That's about place. And so when we think about um, how we can best strengthen communities, having that geographic understanding of the interplay between community needs and community resources to identify how you can respond to those needs. That's why it was so important to us. Awesome. Andrew, you mentioned the human aspect multiple times, and I was also really struck by the work done by the refugees themselves and the emphasis on the human element throughout your story. Uh, can you speak a little bit to this humanizing quality and the agency quality? Yeah, I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, uh, you know, often um, we think of uh, people in crisis as being subject to extreme events, um, and that's true. I mean, that's the reason why there's a there's a um, a need for response. But you know, people uh, in crisis. Uh, organize themselves uh, to uh, respond to that crisis and are really the authors of their own uh, of their own fate. And I think it uh, it becomes a way uh, for us to to build that engagement. I mentioned this a, a couple times. I mean, the purpose of the story map, for instance, is to help people to find a point of contact, to find a way and an access point into a story that otherwise might feel really um, not familiar to you because it's actually very far from your immediate understanding. Um, but by understanding that agency um, of how people actually engage in uh, their sort of self-determining work, um, we can actually, I think, more easily find those points of contact and empathy. And that provides us, I think, a reason to get involved um, and to um, help to provide assistance, to build on the work that's already going by, uh, under, under being undertaken by communities themselves. And, um, you know, I think it produces better assistance and better engagement. Awesome, wonderful. I'd like to turn to Allison. Fines and fees, um, everyone's favorite subject. Fines and fees are usually discussed in purely numerical terms, you know, basically a bunch of spreadsheets with numbers. So is this something that normally grabs and holds people's attention? Yeah, yeah, good question. And it, it reminds me as we talk about extreme events, you know, in the news, you tend to get a lot of um, airtime on these extreme or acute events, you know, natural disasters and protests. And sometimes these um, issues like fines and fees, they're a chronic issue and they're of equal importance. They underlie a lot of those acute issues, you know, uh, poverty, equality, um, racial justice, um, but they just don't uh, instinctually seem as exciting. So what's really important um, for us is to be able to create stories that say how this is relevant to people's lives, get the data out of the spreadsheet, out of your desktop and onto a format where people can see they can interact with the data. It's even more important when you have decisions being made at a more granular level for us, you know, because you get the unit of geography that you need to address the issue that's going on and really put, you know, data transparency isn't just about um, putting it all out there. It's putting it out there in a way that decision makers and advocates and, and people in the public can say, oh, that is why that is important to me. And, um, you know, we've had occasions at the Fines and Fees Justice Center and their coalitions where they've almost uh, had to give their spiel and their talk before they see the maps and show the maps. Because once they show the maps, everybody wants to dive into the maps, interact with them, find out what their community looks like and, you know, do all the sleuthing that that we love to do. Um, uh, you know, as cartographers and map makers. So having um, story maps just gives them those tools to scratch that itch and it really results in not only, you know, 
getting the attention, but sustaining the attention and helping people equip them with the information they need to make a decision at their level of geography. Um, awesome, thank you. And I love the, you know, scratching the itch and sleuthing. I wrote down <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> that's the, I, not sleuthing with maps. Um, so this is really a question for the entire group. Um, you know, Andrew, you talked a little bit about, you know, you had an intern and your intern, you know, came in with no mapping skills, but they were able to create this pretty robust map, story map with maps, multimedia, you know, text, imagery, very, very rich narrative. And so what type of skills, um, and maybe we, we start with Andrew, what type of skills are really required to do a story map? Yeah, I think it's a good question because we often uh, hear map and you think cartographer, you think, um, you know, data scientist and and uh, those things are important. But I think, um, you know, the most important, uh, you know, was just being able to think in both spatial and narrative terms. So understand that, you know, there's a story that has a beginning, middle and end, and, and we want to be able to articulate that kind of arc to the narrative. But the beginning, middle, and end occur in places, and those places um, can be seen um, on their own, and they have their own kind of dynamics and affordances. So being able to see the role that, um, you know, as we branch out into looking at um, how things um, are distributed across um, an area of the earth, that 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 mode of thinking is related to the mode of thinking that puts us into like a, a linear uh, beginning, middle and end. That that kind of um, connection between two ways of thinking was, was key because we could teach them the web frameworks. We can teach them the, you know, how to be able to map a spreadsheet, how to uh, find data online. But it but it's actually, I think, somewhat harder to to um, understand the the thought process around some of these. And, and really, that's what I think we want to cultivate. You know, I'd add to that the in terms of the skills needed, it's it's like every job and every function communication, right? So it's and more specifically to do a really great story map, it's about being clear about what your audience needs and what problem they're trying to solve and having someone who can then take that need and think about that need and present it in a way that's useful for them. You know, as I mentioned, the story map I showed was designed specifically for wise that are consulting for other whys. Well, that's not the same story map we would necessarily use if a why was giving a community presentation. We might present it slightly differently. So it's really having someone who's going to take the time to think about what is it the audience is trying to understand and how can I use imagery to convey that. Awesome. Allison, anything you'd add there? Well, I think, you know, I, I, they hit on a lot of the good points. Um, you know, for us, we uh, in terms of the skills to being able to get engaged in this, we have, you know, certainly started off with the data to see what our story is, kind of fi figure out those cartographic elements. And then there have been plenty of times where we have passed a story map along to a communications writer to kind of um, be able to engage things. And I do tell them, don't be scared. You know, I'll get this, the maps in there. And once they're there, um, you know, you can use the same amount of tools that you would have with just doing the PowerPoint presentation in terms of plugging and placing those elements. And, you know, one thing I'll add to what Andrew and Alicia said was that um, it, when they, um, when engaging with a story map, that linear flow, it's really nice to be able to profile, say, extreme examples, zoom into local geography to say, here's where it's really hurting, here's where it's been consistent. And um, how I kind of describe a story map when we first are in this interactive mapping, when we first start a project, is it's kind of like a choose your own story. You have this linear flow, but you know, just like the children's book where you pick where you want to go to, you're able to, you know, different people can use story maps to tell different stories based on their local geography. And it's also a bit of a lift the flat book too, you know, if you, you're, you're revealing and interacting with data. And so it feels really engaging and that inspires people um, to, to, to shape their story um, as needed to fit what, what their need is in their, their locality or geography. Awesome, thank you. So we're heading towards the conclusion of today's webinar. Any final thoughts or especially tips and tricks for our listeners today? 
Um, I would say the biggest tip I, ha I have is do not reinvent the wheel. There are a lot of really great resources about how people um, have developed story maps and ideas. So there might be ideas that you can leverage and then customize, especially if you're just starting to dip into the space. It might feel a bit overwhelming. So leverage um, some of those partners. And, and, you know, not to speak on behalf of Andrew and Allison, but, you know, nonprofits, we like supporting each other. So, you know, identify those nonprofits that are, are in this space and, you know, reach out to them and connect with them as well. So we all are aiming for the same thing of making this world a better place. So we should, you know, happy to support each other in doing that. Yeah, and along those lines, we use the Living Atlas tons. Um, so being able to have that online repository, that library of searchable stuff can just like kickstart your campaign. So there's sometimes when we're working on something like, um, you know, a hurricane, you know, two week turnaround on a story map where we'll use that existing data that's there from the Census Bureau and local data from FEMA all to just tell a story really quickly using no new data that we're creating, but just, you know, piggybacking on existing data resources. So really use that repository and search for something before you decide to create it, like, like Alicia is saying. Awesome. Authoritative data. Wonderful. <laughs> And just the one thing I would add is get get ready for people to make more demands on you for more maps. <laughs> I, uh, the the more you actually like, you know, get people to see these things and to understand a story, they they it really builds on itself, and and you get a lot of requests really quickly. To like, can you do this map and that map and this? I've always wanted to tell this story, so I I think that's one of the really beneficial things about this is is the the way it it produces that audience. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. All righty. Well, with that, I'd like to express my thanks to the panel, Allison Davis Holland at Self Represented Litigation Network, Maria Alicia Serrano at the YMCA of the USA, and Andrew Schroeder at Direct Relief. And I'd like to express my very special thanks to our listeners. It's been such an awesome pleasure. If you are interested in storytelling with maps for nonprofits, here are some resources on the slide. So at Esri, at, sorry, at go.esri.com forward slash storytelling for MPO. Here you'll find a gallery of nonprofit story map examples, beautiful inspirational examples from nonprofits, non governmental organizations, mission driven organizations. Again, that is go.esri.com forward slash storytelling for MPO. And please follow us on Twitter at Esri underscore nonprofit. Again, that's at Esri underscore nonprofit. Thank you again, everybody, and hope to see you soon. Bye-bye.